The following program is not a New Channels production, and New Channels has no responsibility for the content or opinions expressed therein. Thank everybody for attending tonight. Uh, we are very lucky to have some very distinguished guest speakers uh, to attend our STOP meeting. I'd like to thank all the members of STOP that helped put this together. I'd like to first give you a little bit of history why we're, in, why we're all here tonight. Um, last, month, last year we got a tip, I would say in the early fall. Is this speaker on? Can you hear me all right? You can't hear me? Okay. Is this okay? Uh, last year we had a tip that there was nuclear waste being dumped in the Bristol Hill landfill. As you know, STOP has been involved in imposing this landfill ever since the siding 10 years ago. And this has been what has kept us together to this point. We've been basically the policing agency to make, to make sure that everything is done properly, that it's maintained properly, and that they have complied with the rules that they told us they would comply with back 10 years ago when we were sitting in the hearings of the Oswego County Legislature. Basically, we received a tip that there was nuclear waste being dumped in the Bristol Hill land landfill, which, as you know, is a sanitary landfill. And a sanitary landfill does not accept hazardous waste according to law. And when we received this information, obviously, we had to get it verified. And we were able to check it out, and it was valid. The information was correct. And apparently, the hazardous waste, nuclear waste, was coming from uh, the sewage sludge disposal plant from Mineto. And there's been some documentation, there's been funds for this, and it was cheaper to dump it in our landfill than it was to treat it at a hazardous waste facility or a radioactive facility, whatever you, whatever you wish. So basically what we decided to do is write a letter to the Oswego County Legislature, basically to Mark Lichtenstein, who is the chairman, uh, president of Solid Waste, what is his title? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> well, he's the solid waste man, whatever you want to put it. But anyways, for this to this day, uh, we've been waiting for a response from Mr. Lichtenstein. And uh, I just received this letter January 31st, 1994. We sent our letter, um, I think it was in the middle of November, and we just received a response. And I would like to read this for your information. Uh, Mrs. Marie Austin, President of Survival for Tomorrow Observation Program, RD4, County Route 6. Dear Marie, I am in receipt of your letter of 26 November 1993 regarding the disposal of the sewage sludge at the Bristol Hill Landfill. Like your organization, Oswego County was informed on November 18th that the sludge from the Mineto Waste Water Treatment Facility may have been contaminated with low levels of radioactivity. As a result of this, we are involved in our own investigation into this matter. As you know, our operations are governed by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC, and in this case, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NRC, as well. While we have received a preliminary response from the DEC regarding this matter, see attached, there was nothing attached, as a component of our investigation, we have asked them to pursue this matter further in as much we are waiting for their response. <coughs> we know where the sludge is in the landfill, and we are waiting for confirmation or denial that there is no current threat. Even though I am always willing to attempt to answer any further questions you may have, I suggest that if you have any additional concerns regarding this issue, that you direct them to the DEC or the NRC. Well, we will do that, and we have done that. However, the county landfill is owned and operated by Oswego County, and we feel that they are the ones <coughs> that should be stopping this. The DEC, yes, does regulate it, but they have the power to deny this, this waste from being disposed in our landfill. Not only do they have the power, they do have a law. 
And at this time, Chris, would you just comment on some of that response? Because you spoke at the legislature regarding the BRC law. Okay, my name is Christine Rose and I'm Secretary of Staff. Back in 1990, Oswego County held a public hearing on local law number four, the solid waste law. Um, one of the items in the law was um, we asked that they ban below regulatory concern waste, which is a low level radioactive waste. We went kind of back and forth, but the county ended up writing the definition of BRC waste and uh, passing local law number four at the legislative meeting. The definition was radioactive waste deemed by the US EPA, the New York State Department of Health, or the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to be acceptable for disposal at solid waste disposal facilities. There are articles where the county said they cannot force us to take it. If they try, we will shut our facilities down. I do have that in writing here. Well, uh, last Two weeks ago, um, my husband, who's the town supervisor, Volney, requested a copy of the local law number four. The copy that we had was given to us at the legislative meeting, and it was passed as it was written. There were no changes. When we received this local law, it's now called local law number three, and the definition is any radioactive waste or waste heretofore defined as radioactive waste that has been deregulated by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, Nuclear Regula Regulatory Commission, or the New York State DEC um, of Health or Environmental Conservation, which could potentially be disposed of in a county solid waste management facility. They rewrote it. They changed it. So, <laughs> what's new? <laughs> and basically, um, when it was voted on, this wording that they sent us finally was totally different. Maybe it means a similar thing, but there's a couple words in there that I consider to be loopholes, like deregulated and potentially. I should also tell you that the letter that Stop composed was that we request that the county go in and remove that waste and treat it at a regulatory facility as, as they should. And as the in letter indicates that they know where the waste is and so they, if they have to do it, they will, but they're kind of waiting to see if they have to and obviously it's probably going to have to be public pressure. So hopefully with the speakers that we have tonight and the education that we should receive out of this meeting, that there, there will be some public pressure put on this county to do the right thing and to adhere. Uh, to, to the agreements that they gave us 10 years ago. It was all in writing. They assured us there would be no hazardous waste. Uh, it would be a sanitary landfill and it would be no problem. And all we're asking them to do is to keep their promise to us. And if this is allowed to go on, they're setting a precedence for any other landfill in New York State anywhere. Okay, first of all, as I said, we have some very distinguished speakers tonight. Um, I was, a few years ago, I was at a meeting where Dr. Judith John, Sh John Shred spoke. I knew I was going to have problems with her name tonight. <laughs> spoke, and uh, it, she was just dynamite. She had a lot of things to say, and she's educated the people there, and I went home scared to death. But uh, the woman has an excellent background, and I was reading her Vita, and one of the most impressive things I read in it, and I, I typed it up. And she's, what she's uh, the director of the Environmental Coalition on Nuclear Power. She's a mem member of a Pennsylvania low-level waste advising committee and the former chair of the Sierra Club's National Energy Committee. And what I read and typed was, in 1989, Dr. John Schrodt was invited to the former USSR as a member of the U.S. Nuclear Waste Technology Delegation to inspect the Chernobyl reactor in contaminated zones. In 1991, she co-led a U.S. scientific delegation to participate in the international conference, Euro Chernobyl No. 2, commemorating the fifth anniversary of the 1988 Chernobyl accident, and again visited Chernobyl and met in Moscow Kai Menick and the leading and with leading physicians and radiobiologists. I just thought that was very impressive. So did some of the students today up at uh, <laughs> Syracuse University said, "Oh, we ought to come out there tonight and hear this." <coughs> um, also, we have a, another guest speaker who was going to attend tonight, but due to illness, he could not make it. Dr. Ernest Sternglass. Uh, he's from the University of Pittsburgh and professor of radiology, and he's unable to attend tonight, and he earned his PhD at Cornell University in 1953 in engineering physics. 
Uh, and he also is the one that he has a, some type of patent on the biological hazards of low-level cobalt-60 and other radioactive chemicals released into the environment. It's a paper he produced. And um, it, I, he's got an excellent Vita, too, and I'm really very disappointed that he couldn't make it tonight because I'm sure it would have been very interesting. Um, the other person we have tonight is Anna Mayo. Uh, she's the award-winning investigative reporter with the Village Voice of New York City, and she has a weekly column called The Geiger Counter. I'm no longer with them. Oh, you're no longer? I'm sorry. But That's I was there for 20 years. Okay. <laughs> uh, in, in 1986, uh, she did an investigative series on the U.S. government radiation experiments on humans that was recently confirmed by Hazel O'Leary. And the other person that was supposed to attend tonight and had a prior engagement was Charlotte Hartman, and her topic was going to be on sludge. And we've also invited um, county representatives and Mark Lichtenstein. Mark, would you please stand? I have a letter from Mark. Oh, um, surprise. Actually, oh, here it is. Okay. He faxed, well, I, should, I, I faxed him a late copy, so he returned the favor. Thank you for the invitation to tomorrow's meeting. Regretfully, I will not be able to attend. I hope your meeting is successful, and I think it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> the end. We're very sorry you couldn't make it here tonight, Mark, truly. <laughs> um, also, Christine, didn't you invite some people from the DEC? Yes, Mr. Steve and Ida is here from the DEC. Um, We'll try to be not too harsh with them tonight, but we do have some questions. I think questions. we should give the DEC a round of applause for at least showing up. <laughs> Thank you. Now I open, the, this is the format of the meeting. We're going to let each speaker speak maybe 20 minutes each, or if they need longer, 30, that's <laughs> fine. And after they're done, we're going to open, and they have some overheads and some presentations they might like to continue with and after that we're going to open the floor for questions okay and Judith we'll start with you all right fine um, thank you I have a feeling I'll be more comfortable standing is can you hear me I guess that's going to be the key all right um, I do not want to sound an alarmist. I think I am not. Uh, I do, however, want to present to you information that I have gathered over some 25 years of active uh, research and participation in the licensing proceedings for, oh, about nine or ten nuclear power reactors in Pennsylvania and serving on a variety of advisory groups, both to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which, like New York State, will host a low-level radioactive waste disposal facility. And like New York State, we are in the throes of trying to site a facility. It is not easy. Uh, I, I'm just completing a... Um, uh, a stint with the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners addressing the question of what the Department of Energy and the utilities will do with the spent nuclear reactor fuel accumulating at all reactor sites as of the date in 1998 when by law the Department of Energy is to begin to take responsibility, title, and possession of that waste, provided it has a disposal facility to take it to, and have participated also recently in proceedings of the Nuclear Waste Technology Review Board looking at the problems of the uh, final disposal of high-level radioactive waste at the uh, facility that is under characterization in Nevada, Yucca Mountain. And at the opposite end of the issues of radioactive waste, uh, I, I'm, I've also had a, a long-term concern for and involvement in the decision-making of Congress <coughs> on the deregulation <coughs> of low-level waste, that which is termed below regulatory concern 
having testified in the proceedings that led to the congressional decision to revoke the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's uh, policy statements that would have permitted a very substantial deregulation of what is termed low-level radioactive waste. So I, I want to speak to you about, oh, lots of things, maybe three or four hours worth, but <laughs> I'll try to cut it down to that 20 minutes. Uh, I, I do want to address essentially two or three major issues that may appear indirectly associated with the issue that is before you in this particular area, namely the disposal of uh, sludge that has been found to be uh, radioactive coming from uh, the nuclear power facilities. And I want to talk about particularly two aspects. On the one hand, first, uh, I want to address the issues surrounding low-dose radiation exposure, the new information that has become available to us even in the two or three, three years now since the Nuclear Regulatory Commission completed its revision of its standards for exposure to workers and members of the public. And secondly, I want to discuss and try to put uh, the issue of the management of low activity materials into the broader context of the nuclear fuel cycle and the problems that our society is facing in the management of all forms of radioactive waste. I surmise that there are some people here who have association with the reactors. Am I correct? <coughs> How many of you are either workers or associated with plants? Well, one is right over here. Now, how about some, are the rest of you? Just one. Well, I'm I'm very glad, uh, and and I wish there were more <laughs> folks associated with the reactors because I have found over my quarter century of involvement with this issue that those who, who are intimately involved with the use and the management, production and management of radioactive materials, um, find they have very little difficulty with them. And I think that's understandable. Uh, when the United States entered into the commercial uses of nuclear energy after World War II, it was with the intent of gaining a positive benefit for all the money and research and anguish that had produced and used the atomic bomb. And I think we were all very hopeful that it would prove to be possible to gain beneficial uses of the atom. However, as I have tracked this history personally, and certainly as Secretary Hazel O'Leary of the Department of Energy has um, made public, made the public aware of, there has been a long history of the concealment and minimization of the impacts of ionizing radiation <coughs> on human health. We have now committed to the use of, well, we've had, what, about 115 reactors licensed, and about 109 of them are still in operation. They comprise roughly well, between 15 and 20 percent of our electricity supply, depending upon the numbers of shutdowns and maintenance problems that plants may experience. The nuclear engineering community has developed designs for new advanced forms of power reactors that they hope to be able to market to provide for future <coughs> demand 
for electricity. Over the 50 years of the nuclear industry, <coughs> however, we have not resolved the problem of maintaining control over radioactive waste. From the high level waste generated by the military component, the weapons industry, to the extremely low level wastes that are deregulated or allowed under the regulations to be released to the biosystem. Over these years, I've kept in mind a comment that I heard, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it, I wasn't at that particular hearing, but I've read it in the congressional record. The comment of a member of the Congressional Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Back in the late 1960s, Admiral Hyman Rickover, who was the father of the nuclear Navy, testified before the Congressional Joint Committee. And he warned at that time that it was not wise to proceed with the development and use of nuclear reactors in the absence of the ability to dispose of the radioactive waste they generate. The response of one of the congressmen on the Joint Committee has stayed with me all these years, and what he said was, this is a direct quote, radioactive waste is our grandchildren's problem. Let them worry about it. Well, it's now almost the 21st century. Uh, in the high-level waste realm, we've accumulated something on the order of 25,000 metric tons of spent fuel, and that number is expected to rise to approximately 86,000 metric tons within the next 15 to 20 years as the existing 109, 110 reactors uh, pursue to the end of their licensed life. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission tomorrow is holding proceedings on the extension of licenses for the existing reactors. Most utilities have reserved the possibility of moving to new replacement reactors. Some utilities, however, are moving in a very opposite direction, namely to conservation efficiency and alternative sources of energy. And I hope that all of you in New York are going to welcome that uh, charming chap who's coming from California to head the power authority, uh, S. David Freeman, who is the person who has replaced some 900 megawatts of nuclear electricity at Rancho Seco in California with conservation, efficiency, and alternatives. And by golly, they work. You know, we were told that these were the, the technologies of the 21st century, and the 21st century is, is very close. So I think that New York State may, may find that it has options available to it very soon that will help to resolve some of the problems that you're now facing with regard to waste. Having said all that, as a kind of introduction, I want to address the, the issue of low-dose radiation exposure in particular. Through the earlier history of this technology and its use, the assumption was made that the standards for exposure to both workers and the public could be based satisfactorily upon the data that were developed following the dropping of the atomic bomb, the data on the Japanese survivors. And indeed, those data are the basis of our national radiation protection standards. Over the years, however, we have learned, in fact, going back before the bomb, we have learned that the earlier assumptions concerning level of risk and consequences of exposure were inaccurate. And that <coughs> progressively over the years, it has become necessary to tighten those standards to make them more restrictive time after time as we have learned more 
as we have gained information about the consequences of radiation exposures. When the standards were set, they were based upon the assumption that the individual receiving an exposure, member of the public, an exposure from a, a, a commercial use of nuclear energy would receive a benefit commensurate with the additional risk that that individual incurs. However, that relationship was treated by the standard setters in the following way. They assumed that the benefit to society from the uses of atomic energy would outweigh the risks that are incurred by the individual who receives the exposure to emissions from the facilities. Well, that's dandy if you're the one who gets the benefit. It's not so good if you're the one who is bearing the risk. The risks were assumed to be acceptable to the public. And yet, if we look back through the history of the manner in which they've been set over the years, it is very clear that the public's concerns, particularly those who receive the highest level of risk, have been ignored by the standard setters. And I can say this as one who has participated in the standard setting proceedings of both the old Atomic Energy Commission, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, when the Environmental Protection Agency a good many years ago set a standard for radioactive waste, for instance, I heard the official from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission protest that it was much too stringent. It was 20-fold more stringent, 25 millirem per year, rather than the 500 that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission permitted to a member of the public. Much too stringent. And, he said, we do not measure real doses to real people, and we do not intend to. That was the position of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and it still is. I think until, really until about a decade ago, we as a nation were willing to accept the recommendations of those who were considered to be expert in health physics and the setting of radiation standards. And part of the reason that it had taken a long time for members of the public and the scientific community to begin to question the standard setters is based in the fact that the research into radiation effects had been for many years under the control of the very agencies that by law are designated to promote, <coughs> to promote the nuclear industry, namely the old Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Energy as its successor. Moreover, it takes a long time for the effects of ionizing radiation upon a human being to be observable through epidemiological research, which is to say, very simply, there's a long lag period, a latency period between the time of the insult, if you will, the exposure, and the appearance, clinically, of the consequence. How long for leukemia? Do you know? Five, six, seven years, 10 years, seven or eight. For many cancers, a decade, 20 years. For some, 30 to 40 years. For the genetic impacts, generations. And so, we stumbled ahead. Then, about 10 years ago, there was a reassessment 
of the data from Hiroshima. And the consequence of that reassessment was to understand that the effects experienced with the single blast, the above ground blast, with a plume that moved out and away from the Japanese islands over the Pacific, was a very different effect from that experienced when radiation exposures, even at very low levels, occur again and again through increasing levels in the biosystem, plus entry into the food chain, potable water, and inhalation, thereby affecting internally the individual human being. It was concluded by the Radiation Effects Research Foundation that there was a substantially greater impact per unit of dose administered, or received, I should say. A greater impact, and they were looking at the cancer and leukemia effects. And then came 1986 and the accident at Chernobyl. And I want to tell you what the radiation biologists, the head of the then Soviet Academy of Sciences Council on the Problems of Radiation Biology, had to say to us in Moscow about three years ago. In the aftermath of Chernobyl, Nuclear physicists, radiation chemists, uh, health physicists, and many others examined what their government did not want them to know. And they gathered the data on the distribution of doses from the accident. And of course, as we've all learned, the doses for some were exceedingly high. It is now estimated uh, by one of the nuclear engineers who had worked at the plant in the cleanup after the Chernobyl accident that already some 15,000 of the workers have died, not the 31 that we heard in the immediate aftermath of Chernobyl. But something began to appear that the medical doctors, when I first was there, were unable to tell us about because they were under the edict of their government, of the Ministry of Health, to make no connection between radiation exposures and the kinds of illnesses that they were observing among their patients, particularly among the children. That was in 1989 when the people of Belarus, the Belarusian Republic, we're only beginning to learn about residual activity, residual radioactivity that had spread very widely from the immediate zone of the accident. When I returned then in 1991, the radiation biologists and the physicians in the hospitals in Minsk, in Kyiv, and the people with whom we spoke, the community leaders in contaminated villages of the northern Ukraine, described in great detail the kinds of illnesses that they had not anticipated and that the specialists had not anticipated. Dr. Burlakova in Moscow, the head of the, uh, the Scientific Council on Radiation Biology, said to us, we are rewriting classical radiation biology. What they have found is that the continued chronic, very low dose exposures have a very different impact on human health. It is an impact that's associated with damage to the functioning of the immune system. And it affects particularly rapidly growing young children. Make sense? Yeah. 
they don't necessarily develop cancer or leukemia although there is no question that the numbers of cancers particularly rare thyroid cancer in children have increased enormously in the years since the Chernobyl accident but the impact is this when the immune system is non-functional or even partially functional it leaves the recipient susceptible to infections to all the normal diseases of childhood but also to what they're seeing increase in childhood diabetes allergies gastrointestinal disorders respiratory disorders uh, chronic fatigue and this was something that we saw and heard from from the teachers in the schools and the coaches that the children had no energy the children were tired they had no stamina and I have to tell you that in in the time that we were there I honestly don't remember ever seeing any kids playing hard running and I've heard the same comment from many others who have visited. It seems quite well established now, and interestingly, the establishment, I think irrefutably, is coming from the field of molecular radiation biology. And I think that this is the issue that your community, faced with the, mm, I was going to use a loaded term, imposition, <laughs> the arrival of low-level ionizing radiation in the sludge that will go to your landfill or somewhere that you must keep in mind. Now, I want to quote from a physician's guide recently written a guide for physicians to identify, to recognize, and treat radiation-related illnesses. Think about what this is saying with respect to the kind of concern that members of the public, perhaps to be differentiated from workers who are paid to do the job if they choose to take it, but that those in the public realm have good reason to consider. I quote Dr. Boardman, head of the Center for Atomic Radiation Studies in Cambridge, Massachusetts, <coughs> former head, retired. <coughs> he says, even at low levels, ionizing radiation exposure affects all living matter and can cause not only cancer, leukemia, and birth defects. Many ill effects have been newly identified and are as yet poorly defined and understood. Diagnosis is difficult, partly because no two people will have the same dose or the same injury, partly because access to official records and pertinent scientific literature is restricted. Diagnosis is also difficult because specific radiobiologic effects cannot be reproduced in the laboratory. Then, ionizing radiation targets only a part of any one of the billions of cells, the billions of atoms in a single cell. Its energy is dispersed unevenly among many atoms of any of the approximately 75 trillion cells in the human body. No two people or even comparable DNA segments of any two cells can receive the same dose of ionizing radiation. Much molecular damage is done by ionizing radiation before symptoms can be recognized. Few recipients will have early definable symptoms though some may exhibit a vague symptomatology, including fatigue, <coughs> joint and muscle pain, and gastrointestinal discomfort. But no two will have the same clinical picture. Now, 
In 1990, the National Academy of Sciences Committee on the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, which is a semi-private, semi-governmental body, joined in the conclusion that there is no threshold of safe exposure. And I think although the standards permit an individual to be exposed to an amount each year from nucle the nuclear industry in one form or another, equal to background radiation and in addition to naturally occurring background radiation. Despite that fact, we all begin to need to understand what the cumulative impact of multiple and additive and synergistic exposures mean to the individual who gets those exposures not only to ionizing radiation, it's only one of many, but to the whole range of environmental pollutants to which we are exposed. There can be no question any longer <coughs> that radiation exposures are a contributory factor. After all, they've been part of the way that we've evolved over the millennia, haven't they? But when we up them within a generation or two or three, markedly up those exposures, then we can anticipate what the effects will be. And what will those effects be genetically and somatically? For any positive benefit from radiation exposure, there are going to be a lot of genetic mistakes. And that's what we're really talking about. Now, I can't, <coughs> I, I live within a mile of, of a reactor. It's a little baby research reactor, but I'll tell you, I know some of the kids who run it, and you know, after a party, <laughs> well, <laughs> I get a little worried about putting them in charge. A recent um, PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Department of Nuclear Engineering, I have personally observed engaging in comments worthy of the worst of the ultra-nationalist, hate-mongering anti-Semites. And yet that man may be put in charge of a nuclear facility. Well, that's sort of off the topic, but is it? But is it? Because the facilities themselves, the wastes that they generate and the management of those wastes are in the hands of us, of people like us, and we're all fallible, aren't we? My second major point, so as you don't all fall asleep, is that this is a growth condition. One small amount of sludge, I doubt, is going to kill you. I doubt. It bears a risk. And You've heard now about the way in which the standards are set with regard to risk. The push of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is to deregulate in one form or another, whether it's called below regulatory concern or something else, to deregulate as much low level waste as it can manage. In fact, I recently attended a, a a workshop on the implementation of the new radiation standards for plant managers at which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission probably went through, I don't know, 57 ways, half a dozen at least, ways that waste can be released to the environment with no control, whether there is a below regulatory concern policy on deregulation or not. Moreover, the agency is engaged presently in a massive endeavor to eliminate 
requirements regulatory requirements of the generators that the nuclear regulatory commission and the utilities deemed to be marginal to safety and therefore i submit to you that the acceptance of contaminated sludge or other radioactive wastes that are released from a facility sets a precedent that your community is willing to accept the potential increases in risk to yourselves and your progeny and you can anticipate that those quantities will increase over time in an open-ended <coughs> system that continues to generate ever more of the problem. In my opinion, in a democratic society, the citizenry should indeed have the option to say no. But I think it's very important for you all to under, for all of us to understand that the federal law doesn't give us that option with regard to nuclear energy. Let me read the U.S. nuclear energy policy to you. It's stated at the very beginning of the Atomic Energy Act. Some people in this room have probably heard me recite this before. How many of you have, by the way, ever taken a look at or heard the statement of U.S. nuclear energy policy? Yeah. Chapter 1, Section 1, Declaration, Atomic Energy Act of 1954. Here's what it says. Listen carefully. Atomic energy is capable of application for peaceful as well as military purposes. This is the Congress speaking. It is therefore declared to be the policy of the United States that the development, use, and control of atomic energy shall be directed so as to make the maximum contribution to the general welfare. Parenthetically, that term is not defined in the law. Subject at all times to the paramount objective of making the maximum contribution to the common defense and security. And Secondly, the development, use, and control of atomic energy shall be directed so as to promote world peace. 50,000 nuclear weapons to be dismantled. Improve the general welfare, increase the standard of living, and strengthen free competition in private enterprise. That is our nation's nuclear energy policy under the law. What's missing from it? What's not stated? Not a word about protection of the health and safety of the public, nor the quality of the environment that we will bequeath to our children's children. <coughs> but from that law, the Congress and the courts have determined that the federal regulatory agencies have a superior power of authority. They preempt the power of the states. And although New York State is an agreement state with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, taking over regulatory functions such as the granting of permits for radioactive sludge to appear in a landfill, the state and the locality under that law are not permitted to be more restrictive more protective of the health <coughs> and safety of their people than the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows them to be. You're in a difficult situation. You really are. We have found, however, over the years that as those who are concerned for public health and safety have spoken out at the local levels and at the state levels, that this government agency will back off. They know the facts that I have talked about tonight with regard to the effects of radiation exposure. They understand. 
And so I would suggest to you that it is in your hands to assure that your community, if you choose, does not accept these materials. But having said that, I have to say to you also, if you're not willing to live with sludge in your backyard, in whose backyard are you willing to put it? And if your answer is, as I'm certain it will be from every conscientious person, oh, I can't ask others to assume the risk that I'm not willing to take, then what does that tell us? Our nation is facing, believe me, an excessively difficult problem. And I tell you, from having dealt with every aspect of the management of radioactive waste, we don't know what we're doing. Every option available to us is wholly experimental. <coughs> and every one we've tried so far <sighs> hasn't worked hasn't worked for the duration of the hazard of these wastes. And it piles up. You know what the Department of Energy now says will be the cost just to clean up the DOE weapons facilities? Hanford and Rocky Flats and Oak Ridge and... I, w I was at an MIT conference just a few months ago. <laughs> they kept talking about the T word 1.1 trillion taxpayers' dollars is the current estimate just to clean up, not even to begin to dispose of radioactive waste from the military program alone. Oh, I have so much more I want to talk to you about. I apologize for the length no, of time. Don't apologize. Thank you. <laughs> I told you she was dynamite. I, I just wanted to remind the people that we're sitting here 10 years ago, uh, some of the former staff members. In 1991, um, excuse me, 1981, Lois Gibbs sat right here in this chair, and there was some county officials out there, as there is tonight, and I will introduce you. I really want to thank the, the county officials and the town officials that have shown up. That shows to me that they're really interested in their community, at least to come to an environmental hearing and hear some of these things. And what she said was, they are building a secure landfill at Bristol Hill. They have put in a liner. They have, you know, put a t tablecloth underneath it so things will not seep out. And she says, trust me when I tell you that is not a sanitary landfill. They have bigger ideas that they want to put in that landfill. And she says, don't ever think that is just going to be a sanitary landfill. It will be a hazardous facility. And watch out for those nuclear power plants sitting on the lake. And she was right. At this time, I would just like to take a couple of minutes just to uh, recognize a few of the officials that are here. Um, Howard Rose, the supervisor from the town of Valley. Howard, thank you for showing up tonight. Uh, Claudia Smart, a council person for the town of Valley. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, Bill Pierce, a council person for the town of Valley. We know what we're going to be discussing in the next town board meeting. And we also have Barbara Brown, a legislator from the town of Claremont. Thank you. And Shirley Tabor, a newly elected legislator from West Monroe. Is there any other officials here that I have not recognized? I, as an alum of the Swigo, SUNY Oswego, I also see there's some distinguished professors here, and I'd really like to thank you all for coming. If you'd stand up, because I don't know all your names, but I'm really happy to see you here tonight. Professors? <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very impressive to see you here tonight. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to open the floor to you. Okay, um, I've already given you a synopsis on what she has done. I'm, I'm very interested. I'm going to have to read the Geiger counter. I never have, but I would love to see an article of it. I'm going to have to publish it as a book because I get so many. Oh, that. <laughs> we'll do a book and let us know when it's going to be out. Okay, I Anna. Well, we are. We can't hear, we need your microphone. Oh, yes, all right. Um, here, here. Um, it's a 
say first that I'm not a scientist. I'm just a reporter. Uh, but um, uh, we're entering the uh, 49th year of the atomic age. What? You can't hear? Can you hear now? All right. We're entering the 49th year of the atomic age. And uh, <clears throat> as a re there are many results of this, things that have happened to us along the way. Uh, as a result of fallout from the nuclear tests, uh, it's interesting to note that the United States government lists Hiroshima and Nagasaki as, as, as tests. Uh, <clears throat> partially, they were tests of the, the effects of fallout. That was how the biologists... Cindy, you can't hear. Can, they, can people hear me? Or yes, what yes, am I doing wrong? In, in part, Nagasaki and Hiroshima were tests of biological effects. So that's what they were for the, for the scientists who were interested in that aspect. Uh, Alamogordo was also listed, described as a test that was the first bomb that was exploded in New Mexico. And uh, it was on that occasion that the word fallout was, was invented, actually, a rather dreary word, uh, when they needed a word to, uh, to describe uh, what they felt might fall on towns and ranches around the Alamogordo uh, testing ground. They said fallout, and it, it's lasted all this time. Uh, and, uh, of course, the, the fallout circulates. I think you all know the fallout circulates around, the, around in the atmosphere. We are still getting fallout, especially in the springtime. In the rains, we get fallout from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, <clears throat> and then we get also... What's the problem, Cindy? You can't hear? If people can't hear you, you need to speak closer to the microphone. Closer or louder? <laughs> <laughs> well, is this near enough? You mean you get right up like that? There you go. Well, uh, yes, I don't know how far to go back. That's fine. The, um, we have the fallout, uh, and we also have the, um, um, the emanations from the very far-flung operations of the nuclear industry. That is, from the uranium mines, from the mills, from the transportation of radioactive waste, the emissions and the leaks, which are inevitable, little pinpoint leaks. A, a reactor is not a safe um, mechanism. It, it leaks all the time. Little, there are little pinholes in the fuel rods that they just can't do anything about. And then, of course, you have the emissions from the stacks. And then we have the um, exposures from the radioactive waste dumps, which are leach, which leach into the soil, into the water. And um, I, I would like to say here that uh, a nuclear scientist who is now uh, a leader in the environmental movement told me that uh, during the war, when he was working on the atomic bomb project, the Manhattan Project, he, he said one night to what well, he was a young man then, he said to one night to one of the senior scientists, well, what if the, uh, if the um, radioactivity from Hiroshima um, gets into, uh, you know, is, is carried on the wind and, and falls on us? And the scientists, the senior scientists said, don't worry about that. That's all going to get shot into this strat stratosphere and we'll never see it again. So the young man accepted that with some misgivings, and later uh, he came to see that his original perception was, his original worry was valid. Uh, but um, I'd also like to say that the emissions from nuclear power reactors and the leaks and the large releases which occur in large accidents are, in some sense, more dangerous than, uh, up to a point, than radioactive fallout from bomb tests because they stay down over the earth and they're blanketed over the earth. So you get them right away. There isn't any delay. So uh, the result of all this uh, activity is that every person on earth now has 
a body burden of plutonium and other radioactive uh, substances. Um, <clears throat> Judith has been describing very eloquently the genetic effects and the um, uh, cancer, the high rates of cancer. Uh, also, we should take note that there are somatic effects, that is, that uh, people are affected directly by radiation uh, in other ways besides getting cancer. And, uh, and for instance, um, viruses are activated by radiation. In 1971, at the Shoreham hearings, we have a great uh, honor uh, in this uh, state because the Shoreham hearings on Long Island are the most complete record, wouldn't you say, of any other hearings that were ever done. They went on for two years and every major scientist testified there. And it was deliberately, uh, Irving Like, who was the lawyer for the interveners there, told me that they deliberately wanted to set up a record that would be available uh, to, uh, he didn't think they would win against Shoreham. They did, thanks to Governor Cuomo. But um, uh, he said they wanted to set up a record that would be available to all people who are living near nuclear facilities. So if anyone needs, wants to look at a really valuable um, resource, the Shoreham, the records of the Shoreham hearings are there and are publicly available for people to, to look at. And uh, the one, I was just going to read you something that was said there by Dr. James Watson. Um, Watts, Dr. Watson is a Nobel laureate, and he discovered this structure of DNA. He's, um, he is at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory out on Long Island, and he testified at the hearings. And he said that uh, the development of a cure for cancer was not in sight, and that the reason for this was that the virus, which probably causes cancer is bound up in the chromosome and that radiation activates viruses. So uh, there are scientists who are applying themselves to thinking whether the AIDS virus may have been activated by uh, radiation. Uh, I know scientists who are concerned about the little epidemic we have of Lyme disease. What's all that about? That's another virus that has suddenly appear, appeared. The, I have heard uh, one or two people speculate about the rabies problem. Now, I have a friend up here who says, well, no, 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 you've always had rabies. Epi you always have had little outbreaks. I don't know. There seem to be a good number, particularly when you start with the AIDS thing, there seem to be a good number of viruses around that we, we, we just uh, haven't seen before, or ones that we have seen that are now being activated. Um, <clears throat> now, um, the, um, the living in the atomic age has, had, has affected everything about our society. Uh, the, uh, it's affected all of our political institutions. Uh, the, the, uh, let's take the presidency. Now, what do you suppose it does to a president's head to have to carry that black box around? Well, actually, he has a lackey that carries this black box around with him all the time that contains the codes to um, initiate a nuclear war. I, don't, I haven't read, I don't know if anyone's read who they're going to target this, uh, these missiles at if <laughs> now, but they probably have, have figured that out, uh, perhaps Cuba or New York City or, you know, I, uh, but uh, at any rate, he constantly has that, uh, that um, thing with him all the time. Uh, and uh, then um, under the provisions of the, of the Atomic Energy Act, which Judith was just referring to, the entire United States government, the President, the Congress, the Supreme Court, everyone, is mandated to develop nuclear energy. That's Way to, that, that's under the law. That's what they're supposed to do, and so uh, they have a little hesitancy to to uh, to be too critical because this is their main. This is what binds them all together. And the UN Charter 
uh, now contains the same provision. So it, it, we're, going, we're going on with this thing. And the International Atomic Energy Commission, which is the uh, agency of, of nuclear, worldwide nuclear development, it never uh, mentions the fact that uh, uh, nuclear power reactors uh, produce plutonium so that every time you give a, a nuclear power reactor to a country like Iraq or Iran or <coughs> wherever, you're giving them the uh, uh, capacity to produce nuclear weapons. You're giving them the material. But the, but the International Atomic Energy Commission, now, you, you will look a long time before you will ever see them mention that because they are mandated just the same as the United States government is to, to promote this technology. Then all talk about preventing nuclear proliferation is absurd if you go on giving countries uh, nuclear power reactors. It, it's, it's absurd because you are, you are doing, you, you are doing contrary, you're doing contrary things. Um, now, um, Oh, I'd also like to say, speaking as a reporter, that the Atomic Energy Act uh, contains the only statute on the books that restricts freedom of the press. Hmm. You know, when the P Pentagon Papers were released to the Times, it was quite a, a debate uh, because um, uh, by the Times, because there isn't, uh, the, the Times went ahead with printing because there isn't anything in the law that prevents the, time, the uh, newspaper from printing anything unless it has to do with atomic energy. And uh, the original law, which was 1946, 46. I didn't know this when I started reporting, the original law provides the death penalty for a reporter or a newspaper <laughs> editor who prints uh, mm -hmm. anything, this is to paraphrase it, anything that uh, the government doesn't want you to print that has to do with um, nuclear energy, with special materials, such as plutonium, uranium, and so on. So now, uh, that's uh, muddied up uh, further uh, because, actually, they changed this in 56. They then said, well, uh, they wouldn't kill you, but, but <laughs> you, <laughs> you, risked, <laughs> you risked bringing down an injunction on your paper. That is, they, they would close mm -hmm. down the paper and, of course, the paper doesn't like that because then they lose advertising and, you know, people complain, God knows what. And when I first started writing in 1970, uh, I was threatened with an injunction. There, there, there was some Columbia University professors who um, were defending a nuclear research reactor on the campus mm -hmm. there, which they never were actually able to activate. But at any rate, they said that, that they were going to bring an injunction, and that I wrote for communists, and newspapers are communists. And all, and, but the work, the, I didn't know what they were talking about when they said the injunction, because the village voice, you know, they didn't know anything about that. They were busy thinking about other things. So nobody ever warned me. And I just blithely went along writing these articles. Uh, I should tell you when. It's very interesting when they threatened the injunction. Uh, an old friend of Jesus and mine, Leo Goodman, who was uh, my mentor, me uh, who uh, he uh, was Robert Kennedy's uh, energy advisor, he had been. And before that, he had been the energy advisor to Walter Ruther, so he had lost the two people who had been his mentors. So uh, uh, he, um, he spent a lot, he used to sit up all night telling me about nuclear power, nuclear energy. He knew everything there was to know. But um, I don't, I don't even know what I was going to say. So I'll just the injunction. The injunction. Oh yes, he said. He told me this. He said, "Well, you know, just what I told you now." He said, "You know, the purpose of those reactors at Indian Point. I don't know if we had us. We go then. No, we didn't have it at Indian Point." Robert Kennedy and he came up here and protested against the construction of Indian Point to Governor Rockefeller. Incidentally, it's an interesting little note. Um, <clears throat> and, and I have the paper from the New York Post with, uh, from that period, and Governor Rockefeller responded, well, yes, he had been told by his advisor that one day uh, 
a reactor was going to blow up and take a whole city with it. That's what he said. It's actually reported in the New York Post. But that, um, well, uh, you know, they didn't... That's what he said. He didn't say he hoped it wouldn't be New York. He just said that, that that's what was going to happen. And Dr. Teller was quoted in the same article as saying that all reactors should be built underground because they were too dangerous to put on the face of the earth. You know, I mean, they say different things at different, different times. So Leo said the purpose of these Indian Point reactors and all other reactors is to make plutonium. They're not to generate electricity. There are a lot of other ways to generate electricity, as we all know. It's to make plutonium because they want to use it in bombs or possibly to fuel I mean, to in bombs. Uh, later, um, they stopped uh, the plans for reprocessing. They could still reactivate them, and I sometimes think that uh, when, uh, when I try to imagine what these people are, <coughs> are doing, you know, why are they doing this, uh, I, I think, well, because plutonium still seems to them not like a waste, but like a currency, like something supremely valuable, you know? What? Uh, Glenn Seaborg used to say, we should go, he probably still says it, I saw him, he's still alive, you know, he probably says it, he said, we should go on the plutonium standard, not the gold standard, we should use plutonium, you know? And, uh, and, and I think they just can't get it out of their minds, you know, they just love this stuff and it's gonna be bombs, brings them world domination and so so uh, uh, so you know, let's see oh I should tell you how this how this system this press the press works uh, you're told you're put in this according to the Atomic Energy Act a lot of people have not paid attention to it because it's it's ridiculous it says but some have paid attention it says that uh, you can't write anything uh, that the government doesn't want you to write. But the government will not tell you beforehand whether what you're going to write is going to cause them to bring an injunction. So this a wonderful newspaper man, an editorial writer at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which is a great newspaper, but he, he said to me, well, he said, you know, that has had a very chilling effect on editorial writers. He's one of these guys that wears a green eye, eye shade, you know, and he'd worked at reactors all over the country, uh, at uh, newspapers all over the country, and he said, when the result is that when an editorial writer on a mainstream American newspaper has to write an editorial on nuclear power, any aspect of it, he looks and sees in the New York Times what the New York Times said. And the reason for that is that the New York Times has very close connections with government sources. So when they do an article uh, on uh, nuclear power, an editor, they check it out. Sometimes they don't have to because they already know, but they check it out. They have somebody that comes in and says, well, you know, well, we better tone this down. And they negotiate a little bit. It's described in Gay Talese's book. They negotiate a little bit. Well, we can put this in, and if you let us put this in, we'll take this out, and so. But, but therefore, if you copy what's in the Times, you're not gonna get in problem because it's been checked. So that's the way it's done. Uh, there was, there is, I, I think it still is true that the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, um, when uh, Eugene Roberts was the editor, I think mm -hmm. it's still a, a very independent newspaper, mm -hmm. and they uh, did not pay attention to the system. And also there was an editorial writer on the St. Louis Dispatch, St. Louis Dispatch, mm -hmm. who was very independent. Not the news stories, though. She finally left there because the news stories always contradicted what she said in the editorials. I also noticed that the Boston Globe is really doing some quite uh, remarkable work. They have recently photographed health effects at, from Three Mile Island, and nobody did that. Now, they haven't published them yet. I'm still <laughs> waiting to see. But they've actually sent somebody down there, you know, to to take pictures of these effects which are still visible there. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, uh, I want to say that most gravely, I think, I'm not a scientist, I wish I had been, you know, I wish that that's what I had studied, but I have a sort of a layman's 
grasp of it and high school students grasp that perhaps uh, but most gravely it seems to me that the this nearly totalitarian commitment to nuclear energy has resulted in a substitution of public relations for science. Uh, now, uh, I notice this in particular uh, in the experiments that have been done and are still being done by our great uh, lavish uh, national laboratories at, I think I've got them all, at Brookhaven, Oregon, Oak Ridge, Lawrence Livermore, um, and Los Alamos, I think that's all. Now, they, the purpose of these experiments, as has been um, said in the recent rash of articles about some, although by no means all of these experiments, the purpose has been to find a threshold for radiation effects. They want to find a, a, a level at which radiation doesn't harm you. Now, I think that the reason they want this is that then they will be able to say that, uh, that radiation at high levels is dangerous and it gets less and less dangerous as you go down to this threshold. I think that's the purpose of it, was, was the purpose. So they, they just, you've seen, I'm sure you've seen in the papers here what they did. They injected people with plutonium so they had to have their legs amputated. I don't know if you've seen Dr. Sanger's experiments. Dr. Sanger at the University of Cincinnati, he took, uh, he's still with the Department of Energy. He took 100 indigent patients who were uh, suffering from cancer at the, um, uh, at the University of Cincinnati Hospital, and he subjected them to whole body dosages, uh, doses of of, of radiation. Now, you cannot do anything but kill somebody by, by doing this, and they all died. Now, he said, well, they would have died anyway, you know. That's a big line they have. Well, everybody dies anyway. But these people suffered a great deal, and we have records of how they suffered. And these experiments have been known since at least 1975. They're just coming out now, but the, they were written about, and there was a congressional hearing uh, concerning those experiments. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget, we had a congressman then by the name of Dr. Tim Lee Carter. He was the only, he was the only MD in the Congress, and he was an arch-conservative. He belonged to something way to the right of the John Birch Society, the, the, what, the, the Blue Rose Kentucky uh, <laughs> veterans or something, you know, and I mean, he, he was just the most conservative person politically you ever saw in your life. But when he heard the description of Dr. Sanger's experiments, he got up and he said, this is Frankenstein. This is Frankenstein that I'm hearing. This is not America. So we had Dr. Sanger. We had uh, this uh, marvelously fascinating Dr. Uh, Dr. Patricia um, Coburn. Yeah. She says, that she, uh, they asked her why she didn't tell the people that she was injecting with the plutonium, why she didn't tell them oh, that uh, what she was doing. She said she couldn't think of any way to explain it to them. Those people, they weren't sick. They were just people, uh, Oak Ridge, <laughs> you want to keep away from Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge gave m free medical care to people who lived around there. You know, you could go in, you could get a cold, or if you had a, a Addison's disease. The man who lost his leg, I think he had Addison's disease. So <clears throat> they, they got a lot of subjects that way. You know, they found a lot of subjects. Um, Dr. Lushbow, oh, now there's a wonderful character, Clarence Lushbow. He is uh, now retired from Oak Ridge, but he still serves as a, a witness in uh, government suits against radiation claims. So he's still very much a part of the government apparatus. And uh, he had 89 people uh, for, well, first he tried. This is interesting, very interesting. Think about this one. He thought that the way to find out if there was this threshold was to look at the records 
of people who had been irradiated in American hospitals. And he got 35,000 cases and records, all the hospital records of people who had radiation as cancer therapy. And he looked and studied it, but it wasn't enough because he, uh, he uh, wanted to uh, control the dosage. more. Actually, he said himself, he said, well, what do you expect? He said, the radiologists need business. That's what we needed. That's why we did it. He said, we were in competition with the other people that wanted to cure cancer by nitrogen, mustard, and things. You think we were going to sit back and let them do No, we wanted to get in there with the radiation. Oh. So he, he had a room, a little room uh, constructed at Oak Ridge. It didn't have any windows. And uh, for some reason or other that I failed to understand, it was not sanitary. It had a lot of laboratory animals that were kept there. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> this is documented in Mother Jones by Howard Rosenberg. And so the animals often were diseased and that, but anyway, that's a little side on. The AEC objected to that, actually, told them to clean the animals up. So they took the 89 people and they took them down this long corridor into this windowless room and there they lay and they were irradiated for uh, days and weeks by cones of radiation. And uh, the 88 people at the time that Howard wrote his article, which was in the late 70s, he couldn't find the other 88 people. I imagine they're going to com come forward now. But one child of uh, six years old, he had the cancer. <clears throat> but um, he, um, they convinced his parents that it would be uh, experimental treatment would be for him to go into this room and lie in there reading comic books and uh, and he could have his food served there and it would be that it might possibly help him if they took the cells out of his body injected them into his mother's body and then put them back into his body that might help now at that time scientists at Johns Hopkins said this will not work it should not be done on human beings. It should only be done on animals, if on animals. Dr. Lushbaugh himself wrote in a paper, he didn't publish it in any scientific journal, but it's available. He said, <coughs> uh, well, uh, it's true that other therapies would have been better for this child. So why did they do this? They had to give him 17 puncture wounds to put this stuff in. He died in a slow agony, which his mother has described. There's a law, there was a lawsuit concerning this case. That's why we have so, so much information about it. Dr. Lushbaugh said, well, the purpose, the reason they did this was to find a, <laughs> was to find a threshold for radiation effects for the astronauts. How much radiation could the astronauts tolerate before they vomited, before the head fell, hair fell out, before they had pains, before they fainted? So that's what they did to this child. He was, a, he was a substitute for the astronauts. Apparently the astronauts didn't want to have it done to them. You know, they didn't want to have that done. Oh, I should add that this Dr. Uh, Coburn, uh, Durbin, her name is, Dr. Durbin. I don't know if any of you saw her on television. I found her fascinating. Mm -hmm. I said, did you see her? Yeah. She said, uh, well, that all of the people, I don't know how many people she injected, but all of them had a great deal to be proud of, that they had given their lives for their country, and they had given their lives to find the, uh, to find the threshold, right? You know, they, they had... They had, they had participated in this marvelous thing so that plutonium workers would be able to work uh, safely in the bomb factories. And so the interviewer said to her, well, well, Dr. Durbin, supposing your mother, you know, would you, if she had experimented, and she participated in such experiments, what would you have thought about that? And Dr. Durbin said, I would have just been overjoyed and I would have told my mother what a wonderful thing you've done and when she was dead I would have said well you know she she did a wonderful thing so 
You know, I mean, the, oh, another thing she said, which I found to be very, very interesting, I, I don't know if it's on the subject or off, but it's very interesting. She said she felt she knew her patients intimately. She had never met any of them, but she felt she knew them just as though they were her friends because she had looked at their excrement and at their other bodily signs <clears throat> day after day. And that was her idea of how you relate to another human being. She was, of course, inspecting to see what, how much plutonium had been uh, excreted. I did hear uh, the uh, daughter of one of her people uh, interviewed, and this daughter said that her father, after he has, was injected with the plutonium, he was never the same. He had been a really happy man. Uh, I've seen pictures of him. He was a Pullman porter. Pictures of him with his wife. He was never able to w work again. He just cried all the time as, as a result of this. So um, now, um, oh, I, I perhaps I should also, I may have made my point. They really wanted to find this threshold. But uh, I don't know, you think, I, I'm going on too long. We want to stop now? Did yes. you want to um, do your overhead? Uh, no, I would like to say one thing. I had a lot of other things to say, but I would like to say one thing because it has been so undercovered in our press. I want to say that the people around the Three Mile Island plant in Harrisburg have suffered enormously. And I have been down there many times. The New York Times, to my knowledge, never sent anybody out to the farms. They uh, said in their editorials that the stories of animals dying there and of plant effects were uh, scare stories that they had been uh, invented or it's not true. Uh, uh, the, there has, I can't describe, there has actually been a scientific study by the Amants down there, which went up to, Amants went up to the Supreme Court, was turned back. They found 700% increase of cancer in one area where the plume had passed over. It's very easy to find such uh, situations there. In one subdivision that I visited, where there were about 20 houses, in every single house somebody had some form of cancer, and <clears throat> they were up, usually upstairs dying or had died, and uh, um, they were young people, you know, they were young people. Uh, and in the yards of those houses, in the yards of those houses, there you saw uh, Fasithia that was all blousy like a, uh, like it was a ballet dancer's skirt. And you know how Fasithia is supposed to look or you would see a rose with a little rose coming out of it. And if you translate that into human her terms, it's not, it's not anything that you would want. Or you, s I see, even now when I go, I see the dandelions still have these gushy uh, thing. And the ca I once went down and we photographed and wrote about cesareans that were having to be performed on legions of horses and pigs and horses. The veterinary had been there 20 years. He said he used to perform one cesarean, two cesareans a year. He was doing four a week, you know, and the animals, they don't survive, they're born dead. The pigs, uh, what should have been pigs are little masses of tissue. It goes on and on, and it's still going on. And uh, it, it is, is in, in a, yes, I could expand on how the government, how they have covered that up, and but I, I just wanted to mention that. Yes, Cindy. Um. You talk here tonight about Chernobyl, but they don't have a containment at Chernobyl, and the American reactors have containment. So how can you talk to us about Chernobyl? It's because not going to happen here. It can't. We have containment here. Chernobyl did not have a containment. So an accident cannot happen here. I've heard that argument many, many times from people within the industry. Uh, I hope it is apparent to everyone that each individual nuclear facility, each reactor, is designed somewhat differently from every other one. There are types, yes, but each one is, in fact, a unique plant. 
Of course, the Chernobyl accident is not going to happen here. But our reactors, with their very different designs, are equally capable of experiencing a serious accident that will breach the containment. Now, we didn't come here to talk about high-level radiation and reactors directly, and I apologize to this audience because I think in many respects we, neither one of us, has addressed the topic that you came to hear. But I hope that the point that the, the many points we were trying to explain have transferred to you, to the understanding that, that the National Academy of Sciences now says there is no evidence to refute <coughs> the cancer and leukemia and birth defect impacts of ionizing radiation, they say proportional to the dose. That is, there is no threshold of exposure. What now is becoming uh, a, a common wisdom among those who are looking at this issue is that, in fact, the low-dose exposures may unit for, by unit, be more damaging in the long run, particularly when they are taken into the human body through food and water and inhalation than the cosmic ray or, or the, the gamma exposure that passes through the body and is gone. The point of all that we're trying to say tonight is that low-dose exposures carry with them risks that have not been incorporated into the standards for exposure to you, members of the public. I guess we're going to open the floor to questions oh, now. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Go ahead. Always surprise me. <laughs> well, I see we had the gentleman from the DEC, and Diane and I had a, a meeting the other day with a lady who has been the head of the Oswego County American Cancer Society here. She said something to us that was extremely interesting to both Diane and I, that out of all the cancers, uh, let's say 12 cancers for women, 12 cancers for men, in Oswego County, we are, and, and I may be quoting the numbers switched or whatever, but the women's cancers, we had the seventh highest, uh, there was a set, the seven highest deaths were in Oswego County and nine to the men. My concern is if we're, if we're talking low radiation, because we haven't had an accident, hotspots. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. she told us that there was many hot spots within Oswego County. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess I'm going to turn around and I'm going to look at the gentleman from, <laughs> from DEC and, and say, um, does the DEC, in its wisdom of the state, okay, deal with associations such as the American Cancer Society, and deal with their findings and their hot spots and try to correlate maybe what's going on in our counties or in our state with what they're finding in, in the findings of an association like this that could give us an indication whether it's relative to the nuclear plants or whatever. I mean, this really concerned me to think that our county throughout the state is the highest in the men and women's cancers and we're setting with three nuclear plants here. I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen the hot spots. I'm just yes, saying. we have seen a hot spot. We've been watching one well, for how long? I have, well, I have an, well, I say I have an area on my road that I have five houses that people, at least one in that family has died from lung cancer, and in a mm -hmm. couple instances, two. I can't say that that's relative to the uh, nuclear because we're not close to, to uh, Scriba. But the point is, you know, we have a lot of... Shirley, how uh -huh. far are you? Uh, how far away? We're yeah. probably about 20 miles away. So 20 or so. miles is safe? Uh, uh, well, when, but when I say that, what I'm, right, what I'm saying is I have deep concern that in all of our state agencies, as well as our county or whatever, because I'm a county legislator, that one committee doesn't talk to the other committee, and so nobody knows what's going on. And when you have all this information there that has been studied, 
do you rely on these studies to figure out what the problems are when you walk into an area such as Oswego and try to figure it out? Let me tell you what the department does, because that's the first thing that I think we need to clarify here. The department issues permits for the discharge of radiation. Okay? Uh, that is what we do. We do not go out and do health assessments. We do not set the figures like 100 millirems per year. Uh, those are set by the NRC or others. Uh, when there's associated problems that uh, people believe are health related, that is not the purview of our department either. Okay, what we do is we issue a permit to allow somebody to discharge or not to allow them to discharge. We can reject the permit also. Uh, certain amounts of radiation in certain ways. In this particular instance, we've had requests for permits from the Power Authority and from Niagara Mohawk to dispose of sludge that has very low levels of radioactive materials in it into the Met, uh, Mineto sewage treatment plant and eventually into the Bristol Hill landfill. Okay, that is, that's purely what we do. And what we do, we're basing our decisions on, on dosages, and uh, we take information that we've gotten from the applicants, in this case be NIMO and PASNI, <coughs> and we run that through models, and we do the best scientific evaluation we can based on known and accepted standards. Well, and who, that's... Who polices it? I guess my question is, is who polices it? Once the permit is issued, okay, we're mm -hmm. at the mercy of a permit that was given and nobody cares after well, it's done. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is the one that polices the amount of waste and actually requires the waste analysis plan that the plants have to do so that they can uh, dispose of the material. It should also be remembered that I think only about 8%, or it was less than 8% of the total amount of waste that comes out of there has any detectable radiation in it. But that's going to build, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I'm looking at the fact that, yes, you put one layer of it on, and then along comes another six months, and you put another layer. Well, that doesn't dissipate the layer that was there. Consequently, you've now increased the low dosage. As far as I'm concerned, you have twice as much. And six months later, you put another layer on, you have three times as much. Well, maybe when it came from the one section, it had X amount of whatever you're allowing, but by the time you get 10 layers on, you're well over what's considered low dosage. Now, this is the way I, this is the way I look at it. I mean, I might be totally wrong, but I certainly would like to. When you look at the amounts that we're talking about, and I believe NIMO's, just from NIMO in 1992, it's something like 5.7 times 10 to the minus fourth millirems okay in 1992 and you're factoring that into thousands of pounds of sludge for the disposal uh, as i say we have to take into consideration what are known and accepted standards of practice and that's that's the way that we have to work how is it determined who determines or who who, who measures the radiation uh, in that that um, you were just describing the that's utility measured, that's measured by the company by the company. By the company. Yeah. And it is, mm -hmm. it is done under the uh, auspices of their NRC license. Then they send the figures out to Brookhaven, I believe, do they not? That's what I'm they do with the sure reactors. The, figures go. The, the, the reactors also measure their, the amounts of radiation. Then uh, is there any monitoring done yes. afterwards? We uh, have offered that the department will monitor that for verification. And, and do you monitor for alpha? Beta, gamma, or just for gamma? We'll, mani we'll monitor for everything that, that we're looking for as far as what the uh, radionuclides are in there. I should also mention that I am not a radiological specialist in any way, okay? I'm an environmental engineer, and I happen to be the regional hazardous substance engineer. So I'm in charge of the program under which the Bureau of Radiation acts in this region. And I also promised him if he showed up tonight that we, I wouldn't let everybody be done. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it, I, I would like to add something about that. Uh, I, I, 
I'm having problems with some of the radiation specialists in our state equivalent of DEC. I live in Pennsylvania. But I also have a good deal of empathy with them. Remember, I said there is a federal preemption. The states are not permitted to be more restrictive than the NRC allows them to be. So even if you, sir, wanted to say no, wanted to, in, uh, your, your department wanted standards more restrictive, you wouldn't be allowed to do so. The other aspect that I think is especially important is this business of self-regulation of this industry. <coughs> it's very difficult indeed, as you said, with a large quantity to be certain that the detection is adequate. To know from one day, one load to the next, what is arriving in the sewage treatment plant and in the landfill. And that's a major problem. Let me give you a quick example. Some friends of ours recently, just this last week, went down to um, the Barnwell facility operated by Chem Nuclear Systems Incorporated, which is a division of waste management. They operate the only radioactive waste disposal site in the country that's open at the present time for people all over the nation. And a uh, reporter went down. He uh, poked his knee up against one of the monitors in their um, headquarters building. And he got a reading that went from a zero to 100 counts per minute against his knee. And when he asked the head of, the co of, of the, uh, their division about the dose that they, the reporters who had attended, had received during their tromping around in the rain, around the trenches for waste disposal, low-level waste site, he was told that the average exposure was zero. <laughs> now, you don't have to be a mathematician <laughs> to figure out <laughs> that something isn't right. And I, I hate to say this because I think we all want to have faith in all of our industries <coughs> in this country, but I think that anyone who has the slightest acquaintance with the nuclear power industry and the nuclear weapons industry and their contractors understands fully, as indeed does the government, that these operations and these companies have deeply destroyed the faith and trust of the American people, not only in the companies, not only in that industry, but in our government. And I think that's tragic. <clears throat> A letter today, or yesterday from the DEC, from Mr. Ralph Manna. Um, I, I would like to uh, just read a paragraph in this letter. Um, <coughs> it said, at this point, we have issued a notice of incomplete application to each facility. Uh, the nuclear power plants have um, applied for a permit to continue to put this low, low-level radioactive waste in the dump. But um, they have been given notice that their applications were incomplete. And it says, when we have a complete application from the facility, we will perform our own dose assessment. Uh, they haven't up until this point. The facilities have done their own. Um, because of the interest in these permits, and that's because of the public interest, um, the department will assess the merits of holding a hearing to receive public comment. Uh, I, my husband and I met the new attorney general a couple of weeks ago at a breakfast here in, well, in Fulton. And he was telling us how he was the father of the bottle bill and how concerned he was about the environment. And at the end, I raised my hand and I said, well, right now our landfill in uh, the town of Balney is accepting low level, low, low level radioactive waste. And he said, they can't do that. And I said, well, they are doing it. And he said that they couldn't do it, but to give, you know, he was going to have someone get a hold of me. Well, that Monday, I got a, we got a phone call from his office. And they called the DEC in Albany and strongly recommended that the DEC hold a public hearing. They can't force the DEC to hold a public hearing, but it looks like at least now the DEC is considering having one. I think it's important before these applications become finalized 
Um, one of the things regarding this little, and I'm not an engineer or a scientist, but I have the uh, 1992 Sewage Sludge Disposal Annual Report. This is a report that the nuclear plants had to do in order to be exempted from following state <coughs> law. Cobalt 60, uh, the quantity was 6.6 .6 microcurie. I, that means nothing to me other than from what I've been told, cobalt 60 is a regulated waste even in a low dosage. Now, if it could get in accidentally, when we have a ban that says none, then as Shirley was saying, we are afraid there's going to be a cumulative effect and we're going to get more and more. And if we say, okay, you can have 10 microcuries, but 20 slip in, this is the concern we have. And our county now has made an about face regarding this local law banning radioactive waste. And they should have had monitoring. If they had a law banning this waste, they should have had monitoring set up at the time. I'm very upset with the county. Um, I'm upset with the DEC, not this gentleman in particular, but the fact that they would exempt the nuclear plants. I, I, still, I have to read one more thing. This was a quote in the newspaper. Um, as I said, the law was passed in the county in 1990. Um, it was reaffirmed in 19. It was just reaffirmed the other day, and you know but it in was. In fact, they are, they have, and still are accepting it. Yes, they are. But I would like to read this quote, and it's from Woody Burson. He's a spokesman for one of the utilities. Um, when this ban was brought to everyone's attention back in 1990, Woody Burson said that the utility is not planning such disposal and is not actively supporting the policy. Niagara Mohawk Power Corp, meanwhile, doesn't plan to seek NRC approval to dispose of waste from its Nine Mile One and Two plants near Oswego, mostly because of public perception, yet they have been doing it since 1988, and the county had to have known it, too. We held all those it, hearings I got the about not having low-level nuclear waste in our county. Um, Senator McHugh and Carolyn Rush led a lot of um, informational meetings, and we came to the conclusion we were not uh, fit to accept it because of our water levels and the high level of um, low lowlands that we have in our county. Uh, they went to Cortland and tried to cite it. They went to Allegheny and tried to cite it. They can't accept it there and they won't allow it. We passed a local law that said we wouldn't, but somebody decided we could. And when I asked in the legislative meeting who, who uh, took it upon themselves to okay this, I don't get any exam uh, answer, but I got a lot of charts and figures that show where everything is. But if, if we aren't supposed to have any, why do we have charts showing where it is? And if zero is nothing, and we say no, why do we have it? Well, it's good that we know where it is because it'll be used if it's removed. Uh, how many millions of dollars a ton does it cost to remove something and cleanse an area when it costs over $5,000 to dig up a little 500 gallon um, oil tank and do the drillings and borings around that tank. At a, at a low level waste site in Kentucky, every year the state of Kentucky and the taxpayers spend over a million dollars just to pump groundwater to prevent the continuing spread of radioactive waste that is out of control, out of the trenches. So, I, this is very difficult. These materials have been created <coughs> under laws that, that the citizenry had no opportunity to object to, except we did, you know, politically. We do continue to elect the people to Congress who make these decisions. And they could very easily change the Atomic Energy Act and make protection of health and safety and the environment our paramount objective. But we didn't do that. We haven't done it for 50 years. And I think all of us need to think very carefully about the absolute necessity of maintaining control over these wastes rather than permitting them to be released into the biosystem, <coughs> microcurie by microcurie into landfills where they cannot be contained and cannot be recovered once they begin to migrate. So that plus 
the cumulative impact of ever more. The NRC now says that there's two to three fold higher background radiation on the average in this country than occurs naturally. <clears throat> now, I don't find it with my Geiger counter, my, my little portable counter, but there is, according to what I've been reading nationwide, something on the order of a 50% increase. So it's happening. And the impact is going to occur to human health. Thank you. Um, OK. To start with, Oswego County, when they reaffirmed this, this uh, bill, Thanks, Barb. So I got my arm got numb there for a while. Um, now, did they have this changed in that wording? I have to ask you and Shirley. Was this change? They just reaffirmed it. They didn't okay, have fine. That's what I thought. All right, Oswego County, which is really no big surprise if you've ever been here, ladies. Um, I taught there. Not a shock. All right, they did something. Somebody somewhere, the, the mysterious person or persons that Barb was trying to talk to, uh, did. All of this, it's, it, it seems to me that it would be illegal. I'm, I know you're not attorneys or, or whatever, but it seems like it's illegal and there should be some precedent set in case somewhere in the nuclear world on something like this. Also, it just does seem to me that since they decided to do it anyways, they, whoever, um, that perhaps because they couldn't get it down to Cortland, that by doing so much of this underhandedly, we're going to be determined perhaps contaminated instead of this big cleanup money we've been talking here. Uh, considered contaminated anyways, oh well, so let's go ahead and become the dump. And this is what I have <coughs> happening yes. on both of these issues. Uh, if you have any input, I'd appreciate it. I would say, yes, you're absolutely correct. The nuclear industry and the Department of Energy, responsible certainly for high-level waste, I have heard say in public meetings, wherever we can get in mm -hmm. with a demonstration project or a small quantity, that's where we're going to stay. I heard that just last spring by a company, the head of a company that incinerates radioactive waste. And he was asked, how do you get into, uh, into that community with no objection? Oh, he said it was easy. We started small. Mm -hmm. oh. I would just like to Sure. Uh, we issue a permit to discharge of it in a certain way and handle it in a certain way. If you have a county law, and I believe probably a town law too, right, that prohibits both of these things, they can be more stringent than the department's regulations and our permitting. And that's something to remember here. Uh, even if we write a permit saying that something can be done, first of all, we can write a permit for them to dispose of it at Bristol Hill if the county who owns the landfill says you can't do it there, okay? So remember that when you write you, your permit. You, no, the county has to say it. You remember it when you go back to the county. That's the issue here. The real issue is what the county legislature does, okay? Well, why should we disobey our own law? They made the law already. It's being disobeyed by whoever they are who's already contaminating this and setting a precedent. It's already contaminated. Let's dump more. I'd like to just reiterate what Mark, Mark Lichtenstein is saying here. He said, like your organization, Oswego County was informed on November 18th that sludge from Manetto waste treatment may have been contaminated with low-level wa radioactive waste. They're like saying, geez, what a surprise. We didn't know this. <coughs> You know, we were informed just like you, and, and we're in your court saying we're waiting for the DEC and the NRC to, to make a response. You know, we didn't know this. Well, they know it now. It has been going on. It's continuing. It hasn't been stopped, from what I understand. And so we're if... We're not expecting our next shipment until July. That's what they say. Who knows what they're putting in every week? Yes, we're going to get every two weeks. But there are spots. But the point is, they know where it is. It's going there. It's going there. It's going there. It's going there. Here. We can't have that many spots on the map. But the thing is, if the county can say no, why is not the county mm -hmm. not saying no? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the whole point. The DRC regulates, regulates it. Regulates it. It's our landfill. They own it. They have the ball in their court to say no. What are we going? And then Manetto again is going to have to decide whether they're going to treat it to their sewage treatment facility. And then the industry is going to have to decide what they're going to do. I, we're going to do. We are the taxpayers. But we, we pay the taxes that 
supply the funding for the landfill mm -hmm. and we supply the funding for the people that work there and for the administrator of the county and if we don't want it there we should have the right to say no well, and the make them obey the law if the material if the material is under regulatory control and is considered to be low-level waste then <coughs> it cannot be released in this manner to a landfill it must go to a secured low-level waste facility that is licensed for that purpose under federal law well that one is uh, the barnwell site is supposed to close in june though they may keep it open for two more years but if the nuclear regulatory commission decrees that this material is of so low a quantity that it need not be regulated if it is deregulated under any of their regulatory capabilities then it's no longer a regulated waste and the federal government can no longer preempt then your regulation should be able your ordinance should be able to kick in but you need to have a solicitor who's willing to go after and local government officials who will undertake the necessary legal action to protect your community but it can be done and citizens groups all over the country have some pretty darn good attorneys who'd be willing to help you. Well, let's yeah. explain what rights are under the state also. Now, the state has regulations to govern this. It is not below regulatory concern with New York State. It's governed by our 380, Part 380 regulations. But any permitting activity in the state is also open to SEEKER, which is State Environmental Quality Review Act. And that's where the hearing that we were talking about would take place is under the SEEKER regulations. And in that forum, you would be allowed to make the comments that you have and uh, you know, bring up issues. Uh, not issues necessarily pertaining to the siting of plants, et cetera, et cetera, but issues pertaining to that particular permit. Well, if it is low level, it's being dumped into Mineto, it would seem that it has to start at that point, not being dumped into Mineto first, because mm -hmm. then we're taking it over to the landfill as sludge. So if we can stop it there, they're going to have to take it to a site that's approved. Mm -hmm. no, or, or stick it in their backyard somewhere. I don't okay. know where Hi, my name is Lisa Chetney, and I'm from the town of Mineto. The town of Mineto would continue to take the sludge until the DEC says that we cannot. The town of Mineto, their sewage treatment plant is making over $80,000 a year off of the three plants. And I think something that also has to come under concern is that when they wrote the letter to the DEC asking for the <coughs> exemption to the law and a permit, the reason that they disclosed that they wanted this done was because the poor babies were going to have to pay over $400,000 a year to have this contained and shipped down to Barnwell. So the DEC gave them the exemption because they wanted to save some money. You've put your finger on the core of the issue. It's, it's now, dollars. Only part of that. The DEC did not give the exemption based on the fact of saving so many money. The DEC gave the exemption based on the fact that it was a proper, what well, we deemed under standards of regulation, a proper method of handling that particular waste. Then why doesn't yeah. Indian Point have to dispose in their landfill in Westchester County? They have to dispose down in Barnwell. Their county landfill probably doesn't accept it. Right. <laughs> 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 it starts with you. It doesn't no, start wait with a minute, us. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. It doesn't start with me. It starts with no, it's my. Not get no it starts with your town. With it starts town. with the public. Okay, there's a gentleman. Well, his hand up the back. I'm going to call up him. Can I respond to that? 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 What Lisa just said, this thing can be stopped at the town level very easily. Uh, there, there's a, it's an attractive nuisance. In other words, uh, there's tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to be made by a local sewage treatment plant by taking this. But from what I've heard you ladies speak of tonight, there's no body of knowledge uh, that's available that predicts the outcome of taking this waste. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked in the physical sciences for a good length of time, and uh, we work with principles that are repetitive and predictable, that uh, 
water in most cases will run downhill. <laughs> this happens today, it happens tomorrow, and it'll happen next week. But we don't know what uh, low-level waste is going to generate, so it's a cost-benefit decision. And when you can't predict the results, uh, the cost is infinite. So therefore, I think our Minetto friends here, we ought to mount an effort locally to stop taking <laughs> Then the county has no problem, and the EC has no problem. The uh, power producers have a problem. They've solved other problems. They can solve that one. I'm going to let students respond to this question because I let this gentleman, so let's get some control here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I did want to go back to your comment. Um, is it Mr. Eid? Yes. Uh, concerning the, the, uh, the rules of the game under which DEC has to operate. One of the, the sadnesses, in a way, of our legal and regulatory system is that, at least in our state, I expect here, <coughs> excuse me, if an application does meet the requirements as stated in law or regulation, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for the regulators to deny a permit. And that, that's what takes us back to this interaction in which the regulators are in turn <coughs> um, guided by and directed by the legislators, and y'all elect those legislators, and if you're not happy, then exercise your political ability to make the change. Um, I'd like to ask the gentleman from the DEC, when you were saying about laws being able to be passed, did you misspeak, or could the, the town of Valley pass a law that would cause this not to happen? We already have a law that was a resolution. Oh, there's a resolution on the books right now saying that we will not accept this. But it's it isn't it? And as an attorney, I, I'm not an attorney. I can't answer as to what has jurisdiction where. I really can't answer that. But I know that your your county has a lot of jurisdiction on this issue. I don't know what the towns would be at all. If I understand what Mrs. Austin just said, what you have in place is a resolution. Mm -hmm. You need an ordinance, I suspect. Is that not correct? Do you mean like a part of the zoning ordinance? Or you just mean well, a town ordinance, a local law, as opposed to a resolution. That may be the problem. With the Environmental Quality Review Act that we have in New York State, there is a little more uh, possibilities of uh, denying permits based on public comment, on uh, the public bringing up issues uh, for which there are no mitigating factors, and things like that. So. New York is a little ahead of Pennsylvania on several things. <laughs> there are a lot of reasons I wish I still lived up here. <laughs> Where is that lady right? You got your hand up, ma'am? Are you just yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, what effect does it have on the workers that work there every day, every week, in the landfill? In the landfill. Right. She's in the landfill. <sighs> The, the exposure of a worker in the landfill would presumably be substantially higher than that of a member of the public. Over time, there will be uh, the repetitive risk every time there is radioactivity associated with, with a load that comes in, uh, any, any materials that they handle. The dose, I would presume, would be very substantially lower than the doses that are experienced by workers in the nuclear power plants or the nuclear industry otherwise. But they would be permitted to receive as high a dose as a worker at a power plant. This gentleman in the back has had his hand up. Would you want? <coughs> uh, my name is uh, Dr. Kutzer, and I am a physicist, a scientist, and um, there are some good people among us, too, you know. And after all, it was, <laughs> it was Linus Pauling who did uh, help, you know, promote this problem, bring it to fore. 
and he was punished, and I believe that because he sent out a petition that their nuclear weapons test may have resulted, you know, in a vast pool of genetic defects in America, and uh, and hadn't he had such high stature, I think, and hadn't his colleagues stuck by him, they would have fired him. And many people, the second comment I'd like to make, many people who you refer to as scientists are not scientists. The people who work at NIMO are engineers and businessmen. In fact, there may be a technician there, I don't know. <laughs> well, please don't confuse them as scientists. The second question, or the second comment I'd like to make is I think I'm uh, feel radiantly happy that you're having a democratic town hall meeting. And this is what democracy is all about, and about being informed, about discussion. And I'm terribly appalled that uh, someone mentioned that this sludge has been uh, transported to this dump site for several years. How could you let that happen? We just don't know. know. How could you tolerate that? Yeah. And I think uh, I haven't seen anything here. I don't know whether this gentleman is an official representative of NIMO or there, but uh, whatever. You know, we should have from them exactly uh, what the radioactive wastes are. God, they're a billion dollar company. They ought to spend at least one dollar out of a hundred doing a little research, you know, doing disclosure. As far as I can see, there is no disclosure. My God, they could, anything could go there. It's sort of Murphy's Law. If it can't happen, it will. And if there's money involved, you can be sure they have stuck in a lot of uh, detrimental, toxic elements. It's in the nature of business to do so. So I would really, truly encourage you to be, you know, I would certainly, if I was town president, I would And the second, and the other thing is, if it's so safe, it's got a few Millerenkins, my God, they got a lot of room. Why don't they store it there? <laughs> Wait a minute. They have the technology. They're supposed to have the staff. They've got the analysis, and if it's a billion-dollar company, which it is, <laughs> those reactors aren't cheap. Uh, they better take care of, you know, their own garbage. You know, that sounds good, but may I respond to that? Yeah. Because that is a, a troubling recommendation, and I think it begins to go to the real heart of the problem of dealing with radioactive waste. When this waste is stored on site, who is the regulator? The only regulator. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which under the law is required to promote the industry, mm -hmm. not to protect you, anybody's health. And it is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that is in the process of eliminating its regulations that it considers marginal to safety. It is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that is reducing reporting requirements, that is changing the way in which it regulates so that its future rule-making regulatory uh, setting will be done not as enforceable regulations under the Federal Administrative Procedure Act, they will be by guidance, guidance that is not required to be complied with. And therefore, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will only allow an increase in the release of sludge and other low-activity wastes to go into landfills without any identification, without any regulation. So be very careful about advocating that kind of solution. It sounds good at first. I believe there is a law in Congress now, and I think it has been passed, 
which allows nuclear or regulatory like DEC people, if they suspect there's a problem, it gives them the right to come right on the private property and carry out the necessary measurements. In, in other realms, NRC is, <coughs> NRC is a law unto itself. However, when it comes to low-level radioactive waste, that is covered by our RECWA program. So we do have regulations that cover low-level radioactive waste storage. My other comment is, we, I am a, I'm a, while a physicist, I'm now an entrepreneur, and we're developing very inexpensive uh, nuclear detector equipment mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, hopefully, and it's now $80, so that uh, people can actually purchase it as a group. They feel that uh, there is a problem. It's, uh, they can inform their own person then. Can go out and they can measure like, like that particular device you see. Yeah, I I would strongly recommend to this community that you obtain monitoring equipment. I don't know, sir, whether yours is the best. There's something, there's something I'd like to know. Perhaps, perhaps there's an easy answer. Um, <clears throat> and that is, um, you wouldn't have, you have this radioactive sludge because you have three nuclear plants here, right? Mm -hmm. And the more, the longer these plants run, the more radioactive sludge you're going to have. So I, I haven't heard any um, discussion here of trying to get um, one or two or all of those plants closed down. Is that something that you've also considered as a <laughs> solution? Or? No, I, I think you'll hear a lot of people talking about keeping it out of the nanoway. When you talk about closing those plants down, you won't get the applause. You won't get it here. I'll, I'll applaud to close them down. No applause, yeah. I suggest that if we fail to close the remaining nuclear reactors, if we fail to assist the utilities to move away from that unfortunate investment, this problem can only worsen over time, and we can't afford it. Fellow from the Office of Management and Budget at a recent conference said to the nuclear industry, to the engineers, fellas, the country's broke and deeply in debt, and we can't afford you guys anymore. Think about that at the MIT conference on the future of new, of new nuclear reactors. I'm going to let you speak now. <laughs> um, I live less than a mile downwind of the Mineto sewage treatment plant with my three children, um, which <coughs> is also just south of the sewage treatment plant is a class two hazardous waste site. <coughs> um, yeah, I know. The supervisor told me there was no hazardous waste there. Uh, I am very concerned about the effects to my children and what is their risk. Uh, you know, I know that it's coming to Valony every six months and being put under the dirt. This is being mixed with water, set out into beds, drying, getting into the air, and the dominant wind comes off of Lake Ontario across the site and at my home, and at a elementary school full of 530 children. Um, what is their risk? You should be aware that when the Federal Environmental Protection Agency sets uh, exposure limits, standards, for the emissions of hazardous air pollutants. They do so on the basis of what they deem to be acceptable risk of fatal cancer, lifetime risk of fatal cancer, plus what they term an ample margin of safety, which is based upon the economics of controlling pollutants. And they do so pollutant by pollutant by pollutant. Overall, they'll allow a probability of lifetime fatal cancer, fatal cancer risk, ignoring all other <coughs> health impacts of one in a million. But for those who live close to hazardous facilities, the permissible, acceptable risk is one in 10,000, two orders of magnitude greater. 
I consider this one of the worst failings of our federal regulatory agencies. Nobody is looking at the totality of the risk that your children are incurring from multiple sources of pollution. I speak here as a citizen of Mineto, and seven years ago, I first heard about the fact that the waste was coming from the nuclear power plants to the Mineto sewage treatment plant. At that time, I tried with a great deal of difficulty to get some attention to that matter and was told that since Veneto had been forced to upgrade and build a state-of-the-art sewage treatment facility able of handling Columbia Mills, and since Columbia Mills pulled out of town about an hour and a half after the sewage treatment plant was opened, <laughs> the town was stuck with a huge financial drain. Now, I speak here also as one of the very lucky people in the town of Mineto to not live within the sewage district. I don't have to pay the rates. But in the last seven years, I have had several discussions with Minetoans who do have to pay the rates. And every single discussion I have had with them has been, well, at least it helps to keep our rates down. And that's the bottom line. Also, as a citizen of Mineto, I have had ample opportunity in the last couple of years to learn to understand the workings of the DEC. I don't know about other people, but I assume that most of the DEC investigators who come down, or censor putter people, or whatever, have at least a cursory knowledge of the geography of the area. Needless to say, I was rather surprised to find out that the DEC could find no evidence of contamination from Columbia Mills toxic waste in the river. Then I noticed a very interesting fact. The censors were hung from the Veneto Bridge. I think all of you know that that is not only upstream, but it's up the top of a dam. So the probability of finding leachate was minimal. <laughs> Relatively recently, this summer, I was also informed of another words of wisdom from our DEC. Namely that the predominant wind direction in Mineta is from the southeast. I don't know how that works like effects, no, but dang it all, <laughs> that's the predominant wind direction. So, you know, when we talk about the people who are censoring things, monitoring things, evaluating things, and analyzing things, keep that in mind. <laughs> also, this is the same DEC that said, well, you have all this copper-laden sulfuric acid mixture mess because your, your, your employees out at Nine Mile were not bright enough to realize if you pour sulfuric acid into copper pipes or brass pipes, pardon me, that copper will leach out and you have contaminated water. Well, we can't dump, I have forgotten how many hundreds of gallons of this stuff directly into the lake, so we'll dilute it and dump it into the lake. Same number of tons of junk is going into the lake, the lake but we'll dilute it. Same amount of junk is going into Princeville Hill, but we're diluting it. Cumulative effect, they don't understand cumulative or additive, I've determined that, but they don't know north to south, so what can I expect? <laughs> okay, now, based on the NRC, the NRC would have us believe that four feet of contaminated water from a spill which occurred in July of 1978, or did it, or was it 1981, or was it nothing that never happened at all? Nevertheless, However that spill happened, or whenever it happened, that four feet of water would condense or do something into 18 inches of water with nothing escaping. Now, I've heard of heavy water, I've even heard of heavy water reactions, but I'm not sure that that's what they have in mind. But then, I don't understand the NRC, maybe that's what they have in mind. Nevertheless, this is the basis of which I, as a citizen of Mineto, sit here and say, well, we're being screwed, but so what else is new? <laughs> now, Another problem, and, and I learned a fact from you tonight, um, Judith, thank you very much for that. The um, way that this radioactive stuff handles in the body. I was at the meeting when James Neal presented the new analysis of the Hiroshima data. It was a very impressive meeting to be at. The audience consisted of about half physical scientists with minimal interest or knowledge of biology, and about half with some knowledge of biology, and about <coughs> seven of us who were geneticists. The discussion lasted better than four hours, and it was very, very enlightening and understanding and trying to educate physical scientists into the reality of biological science. They don't understand it. Now you have to understand what we are dealing with here. 
You heard about the increase in autoimmune diseases and immune system diseases that have, have occurred in um, Russia following, or the former Soviet Union republics following Chernobyl. A lot of people in this country still do not understand the concept of autoimmune diseases. I know I got in kind of hot water a couple of years ago when I got up at a public hearing and said I really didn't give a damn about how many people died of cancer in the city. I was much more concerned about how many people got it. Um, the news at only the first half of that comment on there. So I had a very interesting couple of weeks. <laughs> I really don't give a damn how many people die of cancer because I don't want my kids to die of cancer, but I don't want my kids to survive cancer either. I don't want them to get cancer, period. Mm. So who dies or who lives is, is not really the issue as far as I'm concerned. It's preventing it. How does low-level radioactivity affect you? I'm going to list only two elements. Well, actually, I'll do three elements. I'll do iodine. Iodine is a nice one because it occurs all the time and it's always blamed on the Chinese weapons testing. Um, iodine is also a constant emission from the power plants up, hit, up the river. Iodine is kind of handy because it has a relatively short half-life. And when iodine contaminates the milk, you don't have to throw all the milk down the drain. You simply divert it to a packaging or processing plant like dried milk. And it takes it long enough to go from the fluid milk to the marketplace that the half-life is down to acceptable levels. However, iodine, when it gets into your body, whether or not it's radioactive, tends to migrate toward the thyroid. Good old Barbara Bush, remember this. When she had mm -hmm. radiated pellets put in her thyroid, she was not allowed near her puppies for six weeks because they might be endangered. Now, give me a break, guys. How in the world does this radioactivity act in your body? The iodine that goes to the thyroid can destroy thyroid tissue. This may not give you thyroid cancer, but it may give you hypothyroidism with the attendant health problems of that for the rest of your life. You may eventually develop thyroid cancer. But at least you're dealing with an element that doesn't hang around in your system forever and does decay relatively rapidly. Cesium-137 migrates to the muscle, but also to the gonads. The gonads in females are a little less significant than they are in males because all the eggs in our body were formed by the time we were in three months gestation, and they're sitting there in a state of suspended animation, half divided, until the big day when they meet the sperm. The male gonad, however, constantly produces sperm. It is one of the most rapidly growing, developing tissues in the body. As you've heard from people here, as you've heard from other sources, rapidly growing tissue responds to radio radiation. That's why you use it to kill cancer cells. It selectively damages the more act actively growing ones, and hopefully you can kill off more, more cancer cells than healthy cells by using it. However, when it sits in your gonad, Cesium, what is the half life of cesium? I always forget anyway. Some years. number of years. One, you know, years. that's sitting in your in your gonads, gentlemen, for 30 years to get down to a half life. Now there is no safe level, so it can go down several half lights. So you're irradiating your gonads. Now, this may or may not affect your repro reproductive ability. But there's something else that people are learning nowadays that we didn't used to know before, namely chromosome anomalies. For years, women got a bad rap on that. We were told that we got old, and so the chromosome anomalies were our fault. And the male had nothing to do with it. The male could reproduce until he's 110 without any ill effects. Well, now we can look at chromosomes very, very accurately, and in most cases, we can tell whether the chromosomes came from the male or came from the female. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, we can tell whether the extra chromosome in Down syndrome came from the male or came from the female. Surprise, folks, it comes about half and half from either one. How does radiation enter in for point two? <coughs> it's going to be more likely to cause chromosome damage in the male because the chromosome is, the, the cells are constantly reproducing. However, also radiation interferes with the immune system. When it interferes with the immune system, the body either A, doesn't respond as actively as it should to legitimate enemies, and B, reacts against itself. Excuse me, please. I don't mean to interrupt you. I mean, we have other people that have questions. I thought you were going to ask a question. I didn't realize that you were going to be a speaker tonight. <laughs> I would just ask that you close so we can get the rest of the questions right, answered. That's it. Okay, I'm sorry. But there is other people that do have questions. And as far as the immune system, I, I do think we're all scared to death to know that we don't want it going in the landfill. And that's really why we're here tonight, to look at some solutions and how we can actively pursue to stop this and if there's some alternatives. Uh, we've had some people that have had their hands up. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back. You still, you've had your hand up for a long time. Would you like to ask a question? Yes. Um, 
Judith started on, on listing uh, some ways in which the NRC was uh, going to dispose of low-level waste. And you started on that, but you didn't mention that. You said there are a half dozen or more. And I just thought, um, in the context of the on-site storage question, what could we expect if the utility and the NRC was, uh, was solely in charge? I think that's a good question. And with due regard to the state law, <coughs> Uh, the extent to which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission permits the states to go beyond the NRC's so-called compatibility requirements is up to the NRC, not to the states. I took part in their workshop on this topic just a few months ago, and recently they have reaffirmed their regulatory primacy over the states. Now let's say, for example, that uh, a power plant has contaminated oil that it would like to get rid of. The NRC has approved incineration of such oil, and to the best of my knowledge, that can be done on site. Uh, actually, the NRC's regulations all these years have provided only for shallow land burial in 10 CFR Part 61, the Code of Federal Regulations, shallow land burial of low-level radioactive waste. And it was only when the states, pushed by citizen groups, folks like STOP, really objected here in the Northeast, only then did the NRC allow other means of quote, disposal, we never dispose of anything, long-term storage, uh, you know, uh, of above-ground retrievable storage. So I would, I, I would be surprised if the NRC could not override the state on site with respect to what they would probably call an interim a uh, method of longer-term storage on site of low-level waste that would be essentially a shallow land burial. Moreover, through what, what, what the, the commission tried to do a, a couple of years ago was to set below regulatory concern with respect to the practices of the licensees, the generators. And by deregulation, no longer considering a practice of the generator under regulatory control, then the question arises, is, is, is the radioactivity that may be produced in association with an, a deregulated practice going to be considered part of uh, what the, the utility is required to report? So things that seem to be administrative in terms of, of reporting requirements, um, maintenance requirements, and so forth, can in fact operate in such a way as to increase um, materials that, are, that may be released to the biosystem. Okay. Does that begin to answer? OK. Two more questions, and then we're going to stop this, because we'd like to thank the people. A lot of people are clearing out, and I want to make sure we have time to thank those because Terry, you've been so kind to <coughs> take this meeting for us. I'm going to let you ask the question. Thank you. My name is Terry Reynolds of Save Video Productions. Uh, was that your Geiger counter that was just going on for the first question? She's driving you crazy here. Yeah, right? I was hearing the click, 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 click. <laughs> it's clicking in here over there. Uh, and I was yep. just wondering if, if, that was, uh, if that was meaning something. Um, well, I just think it's always a good idea to get some sense of what's out well, there yes, in your background. Sure. You said get about two per minute per square centimeter. Well, natural background. Yeah. For the past. For the past 10 years, I've been living in Boston, Massachusetts. For the past four years, I've been living here, but before that, I've been living in Boston. I did work at a machine shop who has been doing work for MIT University, and I was very surprised when I went to MIT with some titanium parts, and I was directed to the plasma fusion reactor. 
Um, what is that plasma fusion reactor still in existence? And if, do you know if they uh, upgraded the plasma fusion reactor? I honestly haven't followed the all of the, the, the research reactors working in fusion, or the, the, the research in fusion. I presume it's ongoing at MIT, as clearly it has been at Princeton, where they had their uh, short sustained. Because um, at that time, I was, when I was at MIT, they were based, I asked them how did the reactor actually work, and they said basically it's like a large microwave oven and inside of its energy as strong as the sun. I don't know how true or false that that was that the professor was telling me at the time. Um, getting into up in New Hampshire at the Seabrook nuclear plant, um, I was working for a TV station, TV 56 at the time, and we did a cover story of how when they got up to, was it 80% operation capacity, they had safety glass inside near the reactor which had exploded from vibration and I never heard and they dropped the whole thing to the media on exactly what happened. One of the things I found fascinating about the NRC's regulatory policies is that while they will cite a company for violation and impose large fines, if one tracks subsequently one finds that frequently there is a settlement later in which the fine is reduced to practically nothing. Not always by any stretch. Uh, yeah, vibration problems are, are among the information notices that I receive regularly. It's one of the, the many technical problems that, that the nuclear power plants continue to experience. Well, I haven't been to Massachusetts in the past four <coughs> years, and I was just wondering if you've been there recently, if you have heard of anything up to date on the Seabrook nuclear plant, if they're still having problems after they got to 100% capacity in operation. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. I yeah. think they continue to have great problems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one question here, and one question here, and then we're going to close the meeting. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Okay. The, your radiation monitor up there, Judith, mm -hmm. is it really? 16 counts per minute. Okay, and the gentleman back here said it should be about... Well, that's per square centimeter. That may be a large uh, crystal. I don't know what the physical dimension of the detector is inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I frankly don't read. Yeah. I think I knew once, but I don't remember that. Did I ask questions? Yeah, I'm not finished. I'm sorry. I, I have a radiation detector, mm -hmm. and we can definitely tell when they have problems with the plants. We can definitely tell when they are venting and when they're shut down and if they're about to shut down. Um, what I would like to know, you already addressed what the exposure would be at people at the landfill and at people at the plants. What about those who, of us who live in and around the nuclear reactors? What is This, this, you ask just a key question. It, you are really, frankly, totally at, at the mercy of the information that is provided by the generator. If you have a monitor, it will at least give you a comparative notion of what kind of exposure you're receiving on a day-by-day -day basis. So you can tell when there are marked variations. But, you know, the, the standards uh, uh, accept the modeling of dispersion of a plume or uh, of a release from the facility. And yet those models bear more often than not very little relationship to the specific actuality of a given time a given condition of the atmosphere, a given wind direction, wind speed, uh, all of these variables that really mean that, that you, are, you have no way of knowing specifically what kind of dose you are receiving. How does the dose compare with that that's going in the landfill? Mm -hmm. the Is it 10? I really can't say because I don't have in solid information about what, what uh, uh, NIMO or, or NIPA are releasing. Okay, we have 6.6 seconds. 
micropurities in the waste. And what was back in 91, Fitzpatrick dumped 11 purities in Port Lake. To give an example. But bear in mind, the Curie release is very different from the dose that may be received. That each person gets. For each individual, yeah. It's dependent on so many factors, so many variables. Without the specific oh. information of the specific time, the specific circumstances. How the lady in the back? In the uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Sydney Bayman. Um, I've, I've written a lot about low-level radiation, and uh, I've, I've traveled a lot in England and wrote about salad fuel, where they reprocessed spent fuel, one of the most called the nuclear dustbin of the world. And uh, this, I come up here because my niece is up here. She lives in Syracuse. That's how I got involved in this whole area. And it really opened, was awakening for me because I, to me, this area is very, very scary. Uh, it's one of the most, I compare it to the Chernobyl area in, in Ukraine. Uh, there's, there's so much going on here that's illegal. Uh, I was driving up last summer, and we were uh, with my niece, and uh, at the time, all steel was uh, reprocessing radioactive steel. This is just down by Syracuse. And my niece said at the time this was happening, a lot of radiation got out into the lake. Cesium was uh, in the steel was formed dust and was blowing all over the place in the water. So people in the lake, you know the name of lake, but anyway. Um, so people were drinking radioactive water. It was in the Syracuse water system. Now no one in Syracuse really knew the danger of this. If I would go into stores and say, you know what's happening? There was a little article about this big, because they had to say they were doing it. And at the time, the dog that my niece had wouldn't drink the water. She refused to drink the water. And she would notice the metallic taste in the water. Now that's <coughs> not cool. And at the same time, I was doing some research into GE plants. Now you've got to realize there's 23 GE plants, and they're the most dangerous kind. And Ralph Nader said in 74, all these plants should have never have been built and should be shut down. They're built with the one loop so that the steam is radioactive. And the initial steam that heats the loop is radioactive, it comes out. So you, with GEs, and with the other plants, you have two loop system. I don't know. <coughs> what? Yeah, that's the whole point. That's why this town is so scary. They don't know that. There are GE plants here, the worst kind. Uh, Pilgrim is a GE plant, and they have done a health study around Pilgrim, which I have some of these I can give to you. Uh, um, this is Clamshell Alliance, which I've been involved with, and they found this is a, by the Department of Health, which was a very good health study, one of the best health studies that's ever been given. Uh, we have health studies and health studies and health studies, and they all prove, if they're done right, that the cancer rate is in proportion to the amount of radiation that's coming out and to the amount of time you're you're uh, in the area. Uh, I'm trying to, so um, what I'm trying to say is that um, GE plants are 10 times more radioactive uh, than the pressurized water plants, OK? And so you're asking about radiation here. I'm saying it's really quite bad. Now, that's another thing that was very scary. Last summer, uh, the charcoal filters stopped working. They caught fire, and which one was it? Nine Mile One or Nine two. Mile Two? Nine Mile Two. Now, uh, I had a, we had an acquaintance who called up Albany at the time to investigate the amount of radiation that was coming out. They didn't shut the plant down, which you should have done when the charcoal filters. No, it's legal to run. What? It's legal to run for 14 days. Well, oh, it's legal. It shouldn't be legal. Uh, because he called up Albany, and they found out that the radiation was 40 times higher. Okay, this is the time you had this festival up here, Harper Festival. That's what was going on. And my friend over here, Joanne, was calling up doctors' offices and finding out that everybody was getting asthma and all of a sudden these funny lung viruses, which of unknown causes. And she had a lot to say on that subject. So I'm saying that this, you people should really shut these plants down. Other alternative energy. Dave Friedman is coming to um, to. Uh, we're going to shut down Indian Point. 
Okay, we hope to shut down India Point 3 or 2. David Friedman is coming now, uh, and he was the one that reconverted a plant out in uh, California to windmills, and it was much more economic. Now, you need to get this David Friedman up here, and you need to get out these horrible politicians, and forget about your pocketbooks if you can, try and find other sources of employment. I'm sorry, but that's what has to happen. Okay, Cindy, can you give us that question? Yeah, I think that ignorance is bliss, but I want to tell you something. It isn't just happening here, and since 1968, human waste has been radioactive at all three plants. And since 1968, they've been spreading it all over the land in Oswego County. Crops have been growing it. It's only been 76 that it's been going to Mineto, and Mineto land spread it until 86. They are criminals in my estimation, and it's only been since 86 that it's been coming to our landfill. And there is one solution. I'm not interested in sending it to Pennsylvania, where I now believe Indian Point's waste is going. I'm not interested in sending it to Barnwell. I've talked to newspaper reporters all over the country. I talked to the president of a utility in California where David Freeman is coming from. He's the president of the board of directors, and he said human waste is right from nuclear plants, and it's called bioassaying. So yes, to the boys and girls out there that work at the nuclear plants, you're radioactive, and you bring it to my home and my community, and what you excrete is called bioassaying. And I think we need to recognize that there is only one solution. We must stop sending human beings into the nuclear plants, and that means the nuclear plants must shut down. And if we here want to say that we don't want the waste, I want every one of you and out there to pick the neighborhood that you wanted to go to, and I want you to come and look at that mother and say, I don't want this human radioactive waste in Valmy, but I want it in your backyard. We'd better think about what we're making here. Okay. All right. We're going to close this meeting, but I'm going to let Christine make a closing statement because I know she's had her hand up and she's helped organize this meeting. So, Chris, you're the last one to speak. Okay. I just wanted to reiterate, we just discovered... Um, now, some, I guess some people knew that this waste was coming in for many years, but we just found out on <coughs> November 18th. Regarding our county legislature, it's really a pleasure to have both of you here. It's a shame. Where are the other 32? Or where's Town of Valney's legislator, Mr. Buck, who compares what's happening at the Valney landfill? Um, he uh, uses the analogy, there's more radiation from a barium enema. Well, I guess it depends on who's giving you that enema. <laughs> but um, I also want to say that we did, there was, the, the county did have a public hearing four years ago. We went through the procedure, though there were like five Democratic uh, legislators and the rest were Republican. The Republicans were in a caucus. Mm -hmm. They weren't even at the public hearing, but we gave them a little bit of heck when they got back. But they still voted to accept the law as I first read it to you. And then when we got the copy, they did change it. Um, so even when the public does get to speak, and when the county does vote as you hope they will, and you're shocked that they did, they don't care because they are not following their own law. And I think for this meeting, that's the bottom line. That, you know, um, even if you, and I don't, but even if you like nuclear power, the bottom line is we have a law that says zero. And I think that's what we should tell our legislators. <coughs> They can reiterate laws all they want, but <coughs> they follow them. I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight, and I agree with Chris. It's a real pleasure to see some county legislators attend our meeting, and it's a shame that other people don't take the interest. I mean, they are elected officials, and whether they agree with this issue or not, this is not to condemn anybody or attack anybody. These people come a long ways uh, from Pennsylvania, New York City, uh, SUNY people come down, and we have a lot of people that come up here to speak, and I think they at least should be heard. I mean, they, they need to get educated, and I think that's the bottom line. I, I just feel so intelligent sitting between these two women up here tonight because I've learned so much. It's just amazing of the information that I thought that I knew that I didn't, and it, it was just, it's very exciting to have you both here, and I truly mean that. Thank you. I'd like to thank Terry for taking the time to take this, and I'd like to thank you all for coming. Good night. Especially the DEC gentlemen. Thank you.